All right, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Exodus chapter 12. We're going to start in verse 3. So, in Scripture, there are two kinds of lamb that we really need to be concerned about that are both likened to Jesus. And the one that we want to commemorate at this time of year because this week starts the week of Passover and next week is Easter is of course the Passover lamb. Now that's what this passage in Exodus is about the Passover and the Passover lamb. There is another kind of lamb that Jesus is likened to and we'll get there but I already gave a sermon on that lamb so you know if you're online go look up that sermon but for us, let's read Exodus chapter 12, verse 3. It says, Tell the whole community of Israel, on the tenth day of this month, they, must they each must take a lamb for themselves, according to their families, a lamb for each household. Your lamb must be perfect, a male, one year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You must care for it until the fourteenth day of this month. And then the whole community of Israel will kill it around sundown. They will take some of the blood and put it on the two side posts on top of the doorframe of the houses where they will eat it. They will eat the meat on the same night. They will eat it roasted over the fire with bread made without yeast and with bitter herbs. You must leave nothing until morning, but you must burn with fire whatever remains of it, until morning. This is how you are to eat it, dressed to travel, your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand. You are to eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. I will pass through the land of Egypt in the same night, and I will attack all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both of humans and of animals. And on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, so that when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and this plague will not fall on you to destroy you when I attack the land of Egypt. This day will become a memorial for you, and you will celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. You will celebrate it perpetually as a lasting ordinance. This is the establishment of the Passover. And if you were paying close attention to the description of the lamb and of the festival, you can see the parallels of Jesus, that he lived a short life, that he was cared for by his people. Luke tells us that there was a group of rich women that provided for his every need as he was traveling through the land of Israel. And when he went to Jerusalem, the whole nation cried out, crucify him, crucify him. At the Last Supper, he and his disciples were dressed to travel and they ate in haste because the Lord was about to go to the garden to pray. He knew he was about to be betrayed. This lamb is not the lamb that we're told about that takes away the sins of the world. That isn't the Passover lamb. Note that the blood of this lamb doesn't provide for the next life, but for this life. This lamb, its blood above the doorposts, tells the Lord God, pass over this one. When you execute your judgment, pass over this one. This is the lamb that takes away the sins of the world because we are no longer under judgment. But this isn't the lamb that pays for those sins. It's the one that indicates who we are, that we're Christians. We're not under the law. We're not judged. That angel will pass over us. 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul likens Jesus to this lamb. He says in chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, Don't you know that a little yeast affects the whole batch of dough? Clean out the old yeast so that you may be a new batch of dough. You are, in fact, without yeast. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. So then, let us celebrate the festival, not with the old yeast, the yeast of vice and evil, but with the bread without yeast, the bread of sincerity and truth. This is what the bread represents. We are the body of Christ, a body that is unblemished, without sin, that turns away from evil, that rejects it. A bread that is unleavened, it is the same throughout. It has integrity to it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 20 through 29, he builds upon this a little more, correcting an abuse of the Lord's Supper. He tells them, now when you come together at the same place, you're not really eating the Lord's Supper. For when it is time to eat, everyone proceeds with his own supper. One is hungry and another becomes drunk. Do you not have houses that you can eat and drink? Or are you trying to show contempt for the church of God by shaming those who have nothing? What should I say to you? Should I pray you? I will not praise you for this. The original institution of the Lord's Supper wasn't a little piece of cracker and half an ounce of grape juice. It was a potluck. And the point was that everyone came and ate together and no one went away hungry. That all things were shared by the church. He goes on, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this every time you drink it in remembrance of me. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. For this reason, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. A person should examine himself first, and in this way, let him eat the bread and drink the cup. For the one who eats and drinks without careful regard for the body, that is the body of Christ, eats and drinks judgment against himself. <laughs> it's not just that we have to examine ourselves. For he says, without careful regard for the body. And that's not just our bodies, our flesh, our sinful nature. Have we sinned against one another? Have we, have we done things to drive people away? What have we done that needs accounting for before we come to the Lord? And he says, that if we're not part of the body, then Christ's blood is not above the doorpost. God will not hold us blameless if we aren't providing for one another, if we're not making sure that each one has food and drink and is taken care of corporeally as well as spiritually. Now, You'll notice that Paul institutes a few things about the Lord's Supper. One is that it is a memorial. It's a memorial of the Lord's death, that it proclaims the Lord's death until he comes. Now, in Matthew, Jesus says that he will not eat of, the, excuse me, that he will not drink of the cup again until he drinks it new in his Father's kingdom. This this memorial also anticipates the day when we share it anew with Jesus, when we share it in his kingdom, his eternal kingdom. 
And so it looks forward to that eternal kingdom that is to come. And the last thing that it does, as Paul says, is it proclaims the Lord's death. In this way, we proclaim exactly who we are. We're the community that provides. We're the community that keeps the fire of Jesus' gospel alive in this world. We're the ones through whom the Lord shines his light. Now, that's all well and good. We're blameless. That's what the, the Passover lamb teaches us, that the Lord will not judge us. But remember I said there are two lambs. John the Baptist is the first one that refers to Jesus as the other lamb, the lamb who is, and you remember in Exodus it says, you can take that lamb from the sheep or the goats. That word is ambiguous, in other words. It can apply to sheep or it can apply to goats. Well, the same is true of the Day of Atonement lamb. It's a goat. So this is, you've heard of the Lamb of God, the Day of Atonement, that's the goat of God. And there are two goats for the Day of Atonement. One is sacrificed in the temple to the Lord, and the other is said to be for Azazel. And that goat, the priest confesses all the sins of the community to that goat, and then turns it out into the wilderness. And that goat is never seen again. Jesus is said to be the Lamb of God. John calls him this in, in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 29. John the Baptist says, saw Jesus coming and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the Lamb of the Day of Atonement. In Hebrews chapter 9, we have a similar analogy. The writer of Hebrews builds on this a bit. They say, but now Christ has come as the high priest of the good things to come. He passed through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands. That is, not of this creation. And he entered once for all into the most holy place not by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. And so he himself secured eternal redemption. The blood of Jesus is said to wash away our sins throughout the book of Revelation. And when we get there in our Bible study, we'll see this come up over and over and over again throughout the book of Revelation. John refers to Jesus as the Lamb of God. And in the blood of the Lamb, the saints wash their robes, and the robes are made white. They're cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. This is where we get all this language, all these things that we sing about when we sing about the Lamb of God. They come from Revelation for the most part. And so Jesus, by being the Lamb of God, by being both Lambs of God, not only assures that we will not see any curse, any judgment in this life, but in eternal life, in the life that is to come, our sins will be washed away. There will be no record of wrongs. So that in this life and in the next, as the community of God, as his holy church, we can be free to experience the love of God and the love of the church because we don't have to hold each other accountable we don't have to be held accountable we don't have to keep a record of blames and debts I need to ask this question though. Mm -hmm. why is it that as I was growing up in the church a youngster we were always told that we need to watch ourselves because from everything we do on earth that is sinful or not according to what we should be doing, 
because one of the things that I remember very vividly is the fact that I was told that when you die, St. Peter or somebody, you know, reads Saint off Peter the list Peter. of wrongs. Right. Yeah. And so, see, that's quite, kind of like what we I grew up with, and now I'm hearing mm -hmm. just the opposite. So, it comes from a different reading of Revelation. And the question is, do we stand before the throne of God and are judged? Right. But in Revelation, we see that there are those who stand before the throne of God and are judged. But it's not his church. It's it, not the church. It's it not is. the church. Guess where the church is? We're the army of God. And the army of God assembles not to do war. God will go out and wage war on our behalf. God will take care of us. Mm -hmm. The army of God assembles to praise. Our sins have been washed away. On that day of judgment, there's no record to read. Our names are written in the book of life. We go, and we go through a whole different entrance. Interesting. We don't go into the courtroom. We go into the palace where the children of the king live. And that's how it is with those whom the Lamb has redeemed. In this life, we're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, the Passover Lamb. When the angel of death comes and passes over, right. there is no judgment. And in the next, in the next life, in that perfect temple, that perfect sacrifice of Jesus is also the Lamb of the Day of Atonement. Now you might have noticed there were three lambs in my story. Yeah. There's one more that's for Azazel. And for Azazel means for the wilderness. But it's also read sometimes as for the devil. That third lamb is the Lamb of Judgment. And that lamb of judgment has been put out of the city of God, has been put out of our community, and we will never see that devil again. For when he sees the lamb's blood above our door, mm -hmm. the devil has to pass over. Right. Okay. And on that day of judgment, when our sins are washed away, the devil is put out of the city. And all his goats go with him. And that's our hope. That is what we commemorate every Sunday through communion. We commemorate the Last Supper of Jesus. We commemorate the Passover. And we anticipate the day when we'll be united with Christ, united with God, united with the whole church. and there will be no judgment.